preach if I gave her the opportunity there. She got to, she can get to going. Might have to have her fill in sometime. If you're involved in the Immerse Bible Reading Program, uh, tomorrow we start week 7, day 31 of the Messiah book. This past Wednesday we discussed uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians and some highlights in the areas of spiritual gifts. And if you'd like to get involved in the reading process, reading through uh, the entire New Testament with this book called The Messiah, we just got in 10. They've been, uh, as fast as we order them, they've been going by not just people in our church, but other people who use our building, uh, like a couple of different AA groups and people getting involved in that, saying, hey, I'd like to get involved in reading The Messiah book too. So uh, we got them involved, and there's extras in the, or new ones in the foyer you can pick up and... Uh, and uh, get involved in that program as well. If you say, well, I'm just starting, you can find that on the chart inside of that book exactly uh, where we are at and just uh, sort of catch up or start right where we are. It would be great. Wednesday nights we have just a great time of discussion, to say the least. There's an insert in your bulletin if you want to follow along today's message. I'm excited about it, The Way of Escape. And we're going to look at that in just a moment. Uh, Eight of our guys ended up going to the men's conference. We had a great time. Stephen, Will, and some others that are not here today had an opportunity to go. Some 1,500, 1,800 men just worshiping God. And uh, it was just marvelous, just impactful. Just, I wish, I told Will coming back and Stephen, I wish you could absorb. You know, you've been to these things before. I wish you could absorb everything that you heard and retain it. And it's just so good stuff. And you can't write fast enough or type in your phone, but nevertheless, it was wonderful. A way of escape, 1 Corinthians 10, if you have your Bible, verse 13, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13 this morning, and we're going to read it together off the screen. Would you read it aloud with me? Let's go together right now. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Don't you love that part? God is faithful. Let's continue who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what God will do in our lives. Father, let's pray together. Father, give us an open heart today. Help us to have a lean into mindset as far as hearing from you what you distinctly have for me, for each one of us today. Lord, I pray you do a surgery on our soul, our spirit, and our mind during the service this morning, and then stitch us up back together so that we can be whole again for you. Lord, we just pray that when we finish our time together uh, this morning, we'll go back into a world better than when we came in to this service today. And we just want to thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In the precious name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. When I said the word temptation just a little bit ago, I'm sure maybe a lot of different things raced through your mind as it did my mind because we all deal with different temptations of life depending on where we are and what's going on in our life precisely at this time period. And people face temptations today that they really never had to face 30 years ago. The temptations are uniquely different. But here's what Paul said. Paul said there is no new temptation. There is no new temptation. It is common to man. Every single thing that you are tempted with, uh, somebody else has been tempted with that before. There is nothing that is fighting against you or you're dealing with in your life that somebody else and many people have not already dealt with that very same thing. You are certainly not by yourself. No new temptation. Now, that should take away a lot of shame for those who feel, you know, this morning I don't deserve to be in church. You have no idea the temptations going on in my life and how I feel myself yielding many times to some of those temptations. And it makes me feel guilty and condemned and feeling like I'm just not worth sitting in a service or worshiping God at all. And it's amazing. But if the scripture is true where it says no temptation 
has overtaken you except what is common to man, that means the person three seats down from you or two rows in front of you or behind you needs the same saving grace that you need and you don't need to be afraid because we all need that saving grace of God. Can I have an amen? We need that saving grace of God in our life. And yet there are particular ways that we're tempted that uh, we feel like I'm the only one that's tempted. I go to church. I worship with other people in a certain church, and, and yet nobody knows the temptation I deal with and find myself giving in to that temptation more frequently, feeling convicted, feeling condemned, and I seem to be caught, or I want to use this word, trapped in a cycle that I cannot get out of. And sometimes we feel like we're the only one. The only one experienced in the temptation in my unique way. The, the only one that has the thoughts running through my mind and nobody else, no other Christians at church probably deal with the thoughts that I have. No, this is what Paul said about those things. He said it's common to man. What you deal with, what you think about, what you go through, the ways that you are tempted is common to a lot of other people. It's not just you. In other words, you're not that special that Satan would provide a special temptation for you. He's got it in store for a lot of people. Can I have an amen? I think certainly it's the same temptation that so many others have faced. And I'm glad to know not only it's the same temptations, but it's the same grace available to every one of us. The same grace of God is available to all. The same grace that was available to me when I was a teenager and probably one of the worst things that I used to give into was visit my... Um, was visit my, uh, my friend down the street, and his dad used to love to buy Playboy magazines, so I love to go over to my friend's house. You can guess why. The temptation was there. I wanted to be involved in that. But the same grace that was available to me and brought me out of that scenario is available to people today who have different temptations and get involved in things like Snapchat and web surfing and sharing things that certainly and looking at things that we should not be looking at. The same temptations and the the same grace is always available to every single person. Uh, I like it when you read back in church history about the reformers, and the reformers used to use the expression common grace. We use expressions like saving grace of God, that we need God's grace to be saved. It's by grace that you're saved. It's, it's through faith. It's not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. But the reformers used to talk about a common grace. And it's a grace that every person that is breathing today, we all need the common grace of God every single day of our life. And in 1 Corinthians, what Paul is writing about and addressing, he says it's common grace and there are common temptations. In other words, you're not alone. You're not weird because of the temptations that you face. And sometimes a Christian can be a, a person can be a believer for a long time, but they're still wrestling with, they're still dealing with this certain temptation or maybe several of them, and they never have been able to get the victory over that. And I want you to know you're not weird. You're not broken. You're a person like everybody else, and all of us have temptations in our life that all of us will wrestle with to the day we breathe our last breath. Thank God for the common grace of God that's available for every single one of us. There are no real parts broken or missing in your body or your life. You don't really do anything that anybody else hasn't done, and we all need that grace of God in order to see a victory in our life. And the wonderful thing is we can see that victory in our life. Um, it's just like we think that the world has never been worse than it is right now. And sometimes say, oh my goodness, look how bad things are. Here's what Paul said about that statement. There is nothing new. Everything, it's just always been that way. It is, the world has always been the very same way. Today we deal with old temptations in a different way. And I think sometimes we think things are certainly worse where the reality is they're not. For example, today we deal with the same old stuff that the church of Corinth dealt with. The people at the church of Corinth would come to church for a communion service and they served real wine in their church for communion. And Paul says, you guys are getting drunk on the wine of communion. It's no wonder so many people are coming for the communion service. Everybody is just sort of celebrating in a negative way and you're drinking up on it. That's the reason that we use grape juice in our communion cups 
the good old-fashioned Welch's grape juice. We don't want anybody kicking uh, a leg up during our service. Can I have an amen? And so certainly that's why when I hear people say, and maybe you've heard it too, that we need to get back to the way that things were in the New Testament church. We need to have a church like that, and they read certain things in the Bible about the New Testament church. Let me ask you a question. You mean the ones where Paul wrote a letter and said, you shouldn't be sleeping with your stepmother? I mean, those are the things that happened. Amen. You know what I'm talking about in the New Testament church. So we understand that because there was the New Testament church, and it's the same old stuff that every uh, uh, decade of believers uh, since Jesus Christ's time and even earlier have had to deal with. The same old temptations. There never was such a thing as a a pristine time when the people in the church all through the New Testament were just so close to God that everything was just great and wonderful. That never, ever, ever happened. They've always struggled. They always had to deal with temptation. They always had to depend on the same grace of God that you and I have to depend on every single day of our life. It may have been different manifestations, but the same temptations. Different manifestations today, but the same temptations they dealt with all of humanity, you and I. You don't deal with anything unique or different than anybody else or other people have had to deal with as well. And we have to be careful because I think sometimes when we start judging other people about their flavor of temptation and what they do, we say things like this, well, I just don't see how you could be doing that. Well, maybe they don't feel, see how you could be doing what you're doing. You know what I'm talking about. We all have those temptations. Paul wants us to know that we're all facing the same old temptation. You know what I'm finding out? The temptations that we face today at age uh, 66 are the same old temptations that I dealt with at 16 and 26 and 36. And all of us will go in a cycle of dealing with some of the same temptations that we have always dealt with. It is nothing new whatsoever. What you struggle with in your teens and 20s, you're probably going to struggle with all of your life. You said, oh no, I'm going to get the victory over that listen to me. The enemy is going to make sure that you don't get the complete victory over that. He is always going to tempt you. Remember, it's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to yield to that temptation. And we all have temptations on an ongoing way, no matter how close to Jesus we are. In fact, the closer you are, the enemy is going to turn up the temptation level on your life, and he's going to tempt you more and deeper than he ever has before. But aren't you glad once again for that common grace of God Where sin abounds, help me out somebody, grace does much more abound. Give the Lord praise today. I think it's the same need of approval, the same need for validation that we have in our life, the same need for finding some solution to the pain and the ache in our life and our heart and what we wrestle with. And because of our uh, uh, situation of life, we feel like we've been left out and, and things are not the same. I'm not getting the gratification from different areas of my life, my marriage, my work, my finances, the things I want to enjoy in life. And so we always are looking for a way to to satisfy that and the enemy knows that and he's going to tempt you with things that will allow you and cause you to choose the wrong thing and end up sinning against that wonderful grace of God. When you look back at Israel, they created things like the golden calf and other images and they began to worship them because they got tired sometimes of waiting on God to come through in ways that they really thought he should in their life. And it works that way with us as well. As we read God's word and as we pray and seek his face for solutions to the longings in our own heart and in our own soul, the temptation comes along for us to devise our our own way of escape and a way out of the situation. And some of the ways that we find to satisfy ourselves are innocent enough. Others are destructive to individuals. And for most of us, they fall somewhere in between those two uh, end points. But there's always a way of escape. You know, Christian and non-Christian alike, we have to, we're all looking for a way of escape from the issues and the hurt and the pain and the desires that we have internally. And I think all of us have to answer two questions, and that is, uh, what are we trying to escape? 
And that's the number one thing. What are we trying to escape, and what is it that makes us feel trapped in our life? And so we, we're looking for a way of escape, and we seek certain things to fulfill our life, those temptations that uh, sort of automatically come our way. I, I can remember feeling trapped one time. I went to an O's game. I don't think they're doing very well this year, but... Uh, I went to a nose game with my sons and a number of other people, my grandkids. It was several years back. It was in the middle of the summer. They said, hey, we got great seats. It's like three rows up from third baseline, and we can, uh, you know, it would just be a great time. I want you to know I was sandwiched in that seat between people on both sides. I couldn't get out of move. It must have been 100 degrees down there that day. The sun is shining. The wind is not blowing one bit. I mean, I thought I would come apart at the seams. You know the feeling? I felt literally trapped right there in that situation. I just couldn't get out. I couldn't move. It was just way too many people. I thought I would die. I was praying the game would be called or end. I didn't want to sit there and even watch it or enjoy it. And we all get in situations of life that we begin to feel trapped, when we feel inadequate, when we feel lonely, when we feel unsatisfied with life. And when you feel trapped, that is when you devise your own way of escape out of that entrapment in your life. You begin to say, I think I'll do this. I think I'll do that. I think they'll do the other thing. The enemy will provide a temptation. The context, literally, of 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, of which we already read, is, is amazing. And I think in order for Paul to show the Corinthian church exactly what's going on in life, he takes them back to a history lesson and uh, teaching them some of their heritage about what happened to them in Egypt and so this is what he reminds the church at Corinth about in the early parts of 1 Corinthians. He simply tells them, you remember, and I'll just sort of give you the Cliff Notes version here, but you remember when Joseph was a leader in Egypt and his family lived in Canaan and they had a tremendous horrific famine in Canaan. There was no food and so his whole family, which was Hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, their extended family, uh, all came to Egypt because Joseph had favor with the Pharaoh in Egypt. So he said, bring your, your family here. We have plenty of food, and you can settle in the land of Goshen. And so uh, all of Israel's family, Joseph's family rather, settled in the land of Goshen where there was just milk and honey and a lot of food, and they were eating, you know, Chick-fil-A every other night, and it was just an amazing thing they were doing. They settled there. But as the nation of Israel began to grow and get larger, a new ruler who did not know Joseph was put in leadership, and he said, wait a minute, this group of people that's been allowed to come to Egypt in the land of Goshen in Egypt is getting far too big. They're getting so big, they may decide for an uprising and come against us as Egyptians and try to take over. And so they begin to put the nation of Israel in bondage and slavery. Listen, the place where they escaped to began to be the place where they were enslaved in. I want to say that again. Listen to what I'm saying. The place they escaped to began to be the place where they began to be enslaved in. And for us, it is sometimes the place you go to escape will become the place that you find yourself enslaved in and you cannot get out and you're simply locked in. Let me give you a breakdown of this. Um, let's just say, hypothetically, you escape to a relationship that is not good for you, and you know the relationship's not good for you, but you're so lonely, you don't want to live by yourself, you don't, you don't have anybody to date, you don't want to deal with that, you're just tired of life, that you escape to a relationship, and you know it's not good for you, and it begins to bring you down because it is not a good relationship, and even though you know it's going to bring you down, it may be abusive to you, uh, maybe that person is not even walking the same spiritual direction that you are walking in, but you begin to be so lonely that you still want that relationship. What you have found is your own way of escape out of your situation and your loneliness of life, and you would rather walk in the wrong direction with that person than walk in the right direction. Do you know what I'm saying? Am I, do we understand what's happening in that scenario 
I think it works the same way with medication, for example. You begin to take a medication because you have a need for that medica- medication. It's your way of escape. It's your way out of your pain or the things that your mind is going through or whatever it is. But after a while, you begin to be so self-absorbed in that medication that you're locked into it and it has become your way of escape and now you're locked into it as well. It can be the same way with sex. You ask somebody who, who just randomly God forbid, but just, you know, offers their body to a number of different people. Because of that, they're looking for love in all the wrong places. And what they do is get enslaved to sexuality in their life. And it happens before they know it, their own way of escape. And the problem with escaping in Egypt is they can be feeding you quail one day and they're whipping you with chains the next day. Do you know what I'm saying? The way of escape, what we find to escape the temptations of our life can be so detrimental to us that we just simply feel like we cannot get out of the situation. Sometimes the place you escape to will be the place where you're enslaved in. And the reasons are because I just want to escape. I just don't want to feel this way anymore. And it's a cautionary thing to be going outside of God to meet a God-given need. I want to say that again. Going outside of God to meet a God-given need that you naturally have, and God will meet that need, but we don't want to wait on Him, and so we're tempted in some way, and we make our own way of escape. You see, we hear a lot of stuff about the consequences of sin, And preachers and churches are great at saying, don't you do that. God's going to get you. These are the consequences of sinful lifestyles. And we love to maybe say that and do that. But there are, you know, if there were no benefits to sinning, people wouldn't do it. I want to say that again. Maybe I need to preach a a series on the benefits of sin. Wouldn't that be great? I I think we'd pack the place out. The benefits of sin next Sunday. You come and hear about the benefits of sin. You know, there is, there is a need that Egypt meets in a person's life, a need. There, there is a longing that is fulfilled when, in Egypt when the people wanted to go back there. And listen, when, when I go outside of God to meet a need, a given need, guess what? It works. The Bible says what? Help me out. There is pleasure in sin. There, and I know, I know the rest of it. There is pleasure in sin. There is pleasure in sin. It gets you out for a little while. It works until it doesn't. I want to say that again. When we find our own way out of our frustrations of life and loneliness and desires and the list goes on, it works, but it works until it doesn't. It works until it fries the Nero pathways in our mind and and then it doesn't work anymore, and then we want a way of escape. We want a way out. We feel locked in. We feel we can't get out of that situation. And Paul says, you know, you've got to go back, all the way back to Egypt, to understand how God will give you a way of escape. Let's read 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. We'll put it on the screen. Let's read it together, shall we? Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. In other words, he's giving them a history lesson. Remember, all of your ancestors were under the cloud. They followed the pillar of cloud by, by day and the pillar of fire by night. They were all under that cloud. When they got to the Red Sea, they were all went through the sea together. It was a deliverance of God and a leading of God for all of them. When they found no way out, Israel standing in front of the Red Sea and the chariots, Those were Cadillac chariots from Egypt, were behind them and the horses, and they were trapped. Remember the word I used before, trapped in a situation with no way out. The same grace of God that gave them a way of escape is the same grace of God that will give you and me a way of escape in every temptation of our life, every single temptation of our life. And verse 13 says it this way, no temptation that is over that has overtaken you the word overtaken simply means this that you and i are no match for the temptation that comes your way because the temptation is going to overtake you that's what the scripture says it's going to overtake you now i know some of you guys are a little bit closer to god than i am and so maybe you're never overtaken by any temptations 
But I don't read that right here. I just don't read it. We're all overtaken by temptations in our life, and those temptations are stronger than we are. And so it is something stronger than you in your life that you've escaped to, and every one of us know what it is. Pharmaceuticals, it could be sex, it could be food, drugs, it could be donuts, it could be anything. I heard two amens there. It could be donuts, it could be anything in life. Temptation sometimes is a funny word because if we start making a list, we always, well, I know what temptations are. We make a list of everything that we're not tempted by. You know, all these are temptations that other people deal with, and we never write down our own temptations temptations that we we're not going to deal with that one-on-one you know blame can be an escape for people you know I, well the reason I can't do it is because of this and because of them and my job and people in my family and this and this is the reason I can't you know do this and serve God it becomes a scapegoat to them and beca- the only problem is it gives the keys to your freedom to the person that you blame for what's going on in your life I want to say that again when you blame anybody else for the circumstances of your life, you're giving the keys to your own freedom to them, and you're saying, I am locked up until I no longer blame you for what's happened to me, what's happened to my life. And that's a tough thing, isn't it? Because some of you have had some horrific things happen to you, and those things have been because of choices that other people have made. You want to escape from that and find a way out? You just forgive them totally and love them sincerely and you watch what God does in your life all of a sudden those prison bars are open and you and I are free to do what God has called us to do it's a way of escape and so after God had done so much for Israel and after he's brought them through the Red Sea here's what it says in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 let's read it together nevertheless with most of them God was not pleased for they were what overthrown where in the wilderness, as they traveled through the wilderness, they were overthrown and destroyed. They were overthrown in the wilderness. You see, and most of us know this, if you've gone to church very long, it's in the wilderness that your battles are really fought. It's always in the wilderness. That's where Jesus fought his battles of temptation, remember, in the wilderness. And what you do in the wilderness determines whether or not you stay enslaved to those temptations or you're set free. It's our choice to make what we do while we're in the middle of the wilderness battle. You see, the wilderness isn't something that happened to you as a Christian 20 years ago. I went through a wilderness. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not being truthful with yourself. You and I go through a wilderness two or three times every single week of our life. Don't you love it when somebody, everybody comes to church on Sunday morning and people go like this, well, how was your week? I hate it when people ask, how was your week? I do the same thing. I apologize if I asked you how your week was when you came to church today. How was your week? I, I'd love to say, well, let's see, Tuesday was pretty good. You know, I had uh, Chick-fil-A that day and we had, you know, it was, it was a great day. But, you know, if I really would answer how my week was, by Thursday, it was rough. I mean, I'm pulling my hair out. And by, you know, it, is, it, is, it just gets that way. There, there are some days where you, everything is milk and honey, and the next day can be Canaanites and Hittites and Jebusites and termites and cellulites. You know, it can be that kind of day. And it just works that way, and we go through our own wilderness experience. And when they went through the wilderness, they wanted out, they wanted a way of escape through the wilderness, and guess what? They thought their way of escape was back in Egypt. Oh, at least we had something to eat. It's our way of escape out of my wilderness. Let me go back to Egypt. We had good food. They, they just totally forgot that they had to make buildings and make their own mud, bricks out of mud and straw, and they were beaten and worked uh, just endless days, and the list goes on. You see, when someone is tempted by the devil to the point of feeling like they're not enough, you always want to go back to the world. You always want to go back to what is good. Some of our youth, our adults, we get, go to youth meetings, get involved in church, and, and for a while things are good, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and we, we're just so excited about church, but then all of a sudden an issue arises, and we get tempted, and, and then we try to find our own way of escape, and before long the youth group or the church service or the Wednesday night study isn't exactly what it used to be to me, and so I'm looking for something else, a way of escape. 
escape. And that's the reason that people end up going back to what they used to do, but they forget that that's a big trap that God delivered them from, and they're going to end up right back there again, and how much harder it's going to be to find a way of escape from that trap. The more you go back to it, the deeper and deeper that sin cycle becomes in all of our lives. They wanted a way of escape. They wanted to go back to Egypt, and they died. The verse says they died in the wilderness. They died in the wilderness. It was amazing when you look at that wilderness and temptation. Because when you go back to Matthew 4 and verse 1, that's where Jesus was in the wilderness. Let's read it together. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be what? Tempted by the devil. We, we say the Lord's Prayer, you know, uh, don't let us uh, get tempted. And, and we pray that prayer. Here's what Jesus was led by what? The Spirit, the Spirit of God into the wilderness, up into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Do you know why Jesus became incarnate in flesh and, and lived among us and died on a cross and was tempted in every way and driven by the Spirit into the wilderness? Notice this, because Jesus came to the wilderness for a rematch. I just love it. He came to the wilderness for a rematch because he knew the whole nation of Israel had been destroyed in the wilderness by the enemy. They had been tempted. He said, I'm coming back to that same wilderness and I'm going to defeat the devil that destroyed my people. You see, in our strength, we're no match for the devil in the wilderness. But Jesus always shows up in our wilderness battles and gives us supernatural strength to be more than conquerors through Him who loves us. He gives it to you. He shows up on behalf of anyone who will. This is what the Bible says. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not maybe, but will be saved. So Jesus showed up in the wilderness and he paid a visit to the devil who was tempting you and those temptations, it says, can easily overtake you. That's what the Bible says. Temptation can overtake you. We're no match for that. But he came so that he showed the devil, I'm bigger than you, and that he wants us to show, look, I've got a big brother and a high priest, and he's going to enable me to overcome every temptation of life. It's amazing. The devil is not creative. He did not create the heaven and the earth, and he is a not, he's not a very creative individual. Do you know that there are only three temptations, and Jesus faced all three of those temptations, and every single temptation that you and I face comes under the category of those same three that Jesus faced while he was in the wilderness fighting the devil himself. Let me give them to you. I'll put them on the screen as well. Here it is, number one, it's the lust of the flesh. That means these are the things I feel like doing. Everything falls under that, the lust of the flesh. Number one, temptation. Number two is the lust of the eyes. In other words, this is what my senses are telling me I should choose, I want. I, I want to experience this. And then the third one is the pride of life. That means this is what I think I know I should do or I shouldn't do. I, I choose these things myself rather than seeking God for these areas of life. Of life and if you're 16 or if you're 66 we all face the same three temptations over and over again the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and this is a message I've shared with young people in previous times when I was a youth pastor and uh, and just dealing with young people, you're sort of blunt when you deal with young people, like, hey, kids, just keep your pants on. You know what I mean. We're dealing with those issues of temptation in their life. But this is what, you know, if I'd have heard this message when I was 16, I probably wouldn't be dealing with some of the issues that you deal with when you're... Does anybody hear me, what I'm saying? When you know, when you understand... What you're dealing with when you're young and you learn that those are not ways of true escape. They're going to take you back to Egypt. They're going to ensnare you. You'll never have God's grace and victory on your life. When we learn those lessons young, we don't have to fight the same battle all of our life. But today you've got guys and ladies 30, 40, 60, 80 years of age and they're fighting the same old temptation, the same old battle and they never, ever, ever have gotten the victory over that issue of life. I want you to know that God can give you the victory over those areas of life. He can give you the victory over those areas of your life. He indeed will do that. 
The first temptation was Jesus was tempted by the lust of the flesh. He was hungry. He had been fasting 40 days. The devil came and tempted him with the lust of the flesh. Jesus was hungry. Listen, the devil always knows when you're hungry. I want to say that again. The devil always knows when you're hungry. And if you only come to church four times a week or month, if you come four a week, I want to shake your hand. But nevertheless... You, if you only come four times a month or, or, or six times a month and when it's ever convenient for you, you're going to be too hungry and, too, and not strong enough to deal with the temptations that are going to come your way. It just will never happen. You know, when I hear somebody say, well, I don't think you have to go to church to be a Christian, I just wonder where in the world are they coming from? Because a Christian wants to go to church. Can I have an amen? They want to say, they want to read the word. They want to grow because they understand nobody has to tell any of us that I am tempted in different areas of my life and I'm very weak, too weak to overcome those temptations unless I am fed the word of God and we all get hungry. I want you to know that if you're feeding on good stuff, if you're feeding on, let me think of what's good stuff that I don't like, uh, broccoli and, and asparagus and, uh, and all that good stuff, you won't be chewing on the donuts and, and all that. You know what I mean. Your appetite will be taken, but if you're not feeding on the good stuff from God, you're going to be hungry for every other thing that comes along. And believe you me, when you're hungry, the devil's going to be right there and he's going to say, how about this? This is a direction. This is something that will satisfy that longing. This will work in your life. And you've, been, you've been wrong so bad, you know, nobody cares. God doesn't care. And the temptation will always be there in your life. Another one is temptation Jesus faced was the pride of life. In other words, Satan said, if you're really the son of God, just throw yourself down from this pinnacle of the temple and, and the angels would take care of you. In other words, he was simply saying, why don't you prove that you're the son of God? To us, it would be prove that you're a real man. Prove that you, uh, you have your act together. Prove other people really like you, that you're doing what is acceptable in society today. And then Jesus faced the third one and it was the lust of the eyes. And Satan took Jesus up to a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, if you'll bow down to me and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. What he really wanted to do is distract Jesus from going to the cross because he knew if Jesus went to the cross, all those kingdoms of the world were going to automatically belong to him. And he wanted to destroy that. Just like God will offer you a way of escape, the enemy of your soul is going to offer you a way of escape. And we have to be wise enough to choose the right choice because all of us will find a way of escape from the issues of our life. When I read that, and I'm aiming toward a conclusion, underline the word aiming, Jesus in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights. I think most of us remember that. The question is why 40? That's the exact number of years the nation of Israel spent in the wilderness. So Jesus said, I'm going to do in 40 days what the nation of Israel couldn't do in 40 years. I'm going to give them my grace that is going to be sufficient for them. Let's read 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 one more time together. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. He's going to give you that way of escape. You see, the same spirit that enabled Jesus to endure the temptations of the wilderness and go to the cross and despise and despise its shame and sit down at the right hand of the Father is the same spirit, you know what I'm going to say, that lives inside of you and me as a believer. The very same spirit of God. Here's a question for us. What allowed Jesus... What allowed Jesus to overcome his temptations in the wilderness? It's interesting. What Jesus did in Matthew 4 with the temptations in the wilderness, what allowed him to be a conqueror in those areas of his life of temptation happened back in Matthew chapter 3 when he was baptized in the Jordan River. You see, Jesus wasn't baptized in the Jordan River just to show all of us, you need to be baptized, I'm being baptized, so every believer needs to be baptized as well. Remember, when Jesus was baptized, not only did the Spirit descend, and it didn't look like a dove, it said the Spirit descended like a dove descends, a spirit, the spirit of God descended on Jesus and then there was the father speaking and what did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I 
am well pleased. Jesus received affirmation from his father of who he really was. And when he did that, he was ready to go into the wilderness because when the enemy of his soul, namely Satan himself, called into question, if you are really the Son of God, Jesus didn't have to think about it twice because his father had already affirmed him, you are my beloved son and there's no need to prove yourself to anybody. Listen, when you have that kind of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you know your heart and life is totally committed to him it doesn't matter what the enemy calls into question I've been tithing all of my life and I haven't seen the blessings of God listen the faith in obedience is not a means to an end you guys heard it this weekend that is the end it doesn't matter what happens to you all of your life you just remain faithful and obedient faithful and obedient faithful and obedient. You see, before Hebrews chapter 12, you've got to read Hebrews chapter 11. Oh, they were overcomers, but there were a lot of those guys who lived all of their life faithful and obedient, but like Isaiah, they were sawn in two and crucified upside down and lost their life, and their prayers seemingly were never answered, but they were always faithful, and they were always obedient, and God came through for them in the end, and they were awarded that righteousness in heaven. You see, you can make it through the wilderness when you've been through the experience with God all of your life. You can make it through. God has always, already made a way of escape for you no matter what you're dealing with. You say, well, you have no idea the temptations I face in the privacy of my home, in my car, when I'm out, my, my eyes, what I want to listen to, what I want to do, all these things, all of them fall under the three categories that Jesus was tempted in. And I want you to know I may not know about those things that you deal with, but God knows all about them. And he's telling you this morning, I don't care what you wrestle with, it's common to man. Other people are dealing with it now. Other people have dealt with it in the past and my grace has been sufficient for them and it will be sufficient for you as well. Oh, if you want a victory, there's got to be a battle. But you'll never have and win that battle until you equip yourself and train yourself with the power and the sword of the Word of God. It is a must for your life. Man, I'm going to start preaching in just a few minutes. I don't know about you, but I sometimes need a refreshing in my soul. I need to come before God because here's where the enemy works. You're a pastor. You've been a Christian for a long time. You've been in church 30 years. I mean, you have a certain amount of respect and, and you have respect for your people and, and you can just go through the motions. Those are the temptations that a pastor faces. Do you know that when I, at the men's retreat, all the ministers had to get up on the platform and the other guys down there, we're praying for each other and we're sharing what it is. And, and my prayer to other ministers as we pray for one another is this. Never let me allow who, what I do every week, as far as being a pastor, to be an excuse for my personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to always have that burning down deep inside. It is different. Lord, let me not just study a word or read to prepare a message or a lesson, but I need something myself because if I don't watch it, the enemy is going to come along and find a way of escape for me, and I'm going to end up in a situation. You know, the Apostle Paul knew that too. He said, lest I preach to others, I myself become what? What is the word he used? A castaway. Lest I become a castaway. If Paul could do it, I can fall into that temptation. All of us can fall into temptation, but greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. We can overcome every temptation and we give God glory. Amen. I'm going to ask all of you guys, I wasn't going to say the worship team, but it's a few more than that. I'm going to ask all you guys, would you join me on the platform today? Would the rest of you stand today? And just bowing our hearts in the presence of God. Lord, I love you today. Lord Jesus, your word is something. It is a powerful force in my life. Lord, I haven't preached down to people today. I've just shared your word. I need it myself as well as anybody. It's common to man. Our temptations are common to man. And the devil didn't make a special temptation for me or anybody else in the, in the room. There are only three categories of temptations, and Jesus faced and conquered them all. But you gave us the victory. And today, right now in this service, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed and people are just in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is so faithful. God is faithful. We read that in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful. 
His Spirit is speaking to you right now. Just take a few moments to listen to Him. What is God saying to me right now about my life? What is He talking to me about? Just, just take a few moments and let Him talk to you about every issue of your life. And He's speaking to me. He's speaking to you. And we're listening. Lord, I want to hear you today. I want to hear you. I, I don't want to become defensive. I don't, I, I don't want to cast you away. I don't want to come across like I've got it all together. No, it's common to man, and I need you today. Speak to my heart this morning. Let me know, Lord, that there are issues and areas and temptations, ways of escape that I look for. And, Lord, you've made a different way of escape for me for every single temptation. I want to honor you with those areas. It may not be easy, but I want to honor you with that area. I need you to change my life from the inside out today would you just do that right now as we wait and the would you just worship him just a little bit worship him audibly just vocally worship him with me lord i love you today i worship you this morning thank you that you know what i need thank you for the surgery that you've done inside my heart today during this service lord right now you're sewing me back up you've taken out the cancer i've confessed it to you right now i confess it to you and as i confess it lord forgive me lord give me the grace lord do this work in my life that i know i need you're reaching down deep inside where the womb is and you're pulling the extracting the cancer that'll kill me eventually you're extracting that stuff and then as i say lord thank you thank you for what you've done you can just take your holy spirit and sew me back up and heal me in the name of the lord so that i'm whole again when i leave the building today i'm not going to leave the same way i came in because of the power and the grace of almighty god lord i believe today I believe today you're going to give people the victory. I see that victory in the mighty name of the Lord. I'm going to ask our sound tech if you'll go ahead and start that track.